So after the video that I did yesterday where I was talking about the millennium, I realized that we don't really have a lot of clarity. People don't usually teach on it. They don't teach about what it is and what's supposed to be happening during that time. We're going to talk about the millennium. We're going to talk about who's present during the millennium, what our role is during the millennium, the point of it, what Christ is doing during the millennium. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about when Satan is released at the end and why that happens and anything else that comes on my mind as I do the video. So let's take a look at the millennium. All right, so the millennium is what we call the day of the Lord. The millennium was a specific time period of a thousand years that would take place. And after that, then this present earth and heavens would be dissolved. And then we would have what's called the day of God. So we go from the day of the Lord, which is the millennium, it's the day of the Lord, when Christ is going to rule. And then that is all dissolved, and then we begin the day of God. So Second Peter is the passage that we go to that talks about this thousand-year day, that the day of the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. We're talking about the great day. And what the great day is, it's one day of a thousand years of 7,000 years of human history. So there is a great week of human history. It's broken down into seven days. The last thousand years of this great week of human history is going to be the millennium. It's the day of the Lord. So let's take a look at, at 2 Peter chapter 3 and we'll start at verse 8. But do not ignore this fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So God has his seven days of creation and we have ours. So in seven days, God created the earth and then he has his great week where there's seven days and each day is a thousand years long. Verse nine, the Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness, but is forbearing toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Verse 10, but the day of the Lord, that is this thousand year day, will come like a thief. Okay, and now Peter is going to jump all the way over to how this day ends. It comes in like a thief. It's here. Okay, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will be dissolved with fire and the earth and the works that are upon it will be burned up. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of persons ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? Okay, not the day of the Lord, the day of God. Because of which the heavens will be kindled and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire. But according to his promise, we wait for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. If we were to look at this on a timeline, this is the 7,000 years of human history, okay? This is 7,000 years, and this is the great week of human history. The last day of this week is the millennium. It's 1,000 years, so there's 6,000 years over here, from here to there, and then we have the millennium. The millennium is the day of the Lord, and it's also that great day. Peter tells us that after the millennium is over, that everything is going to be dissolved and burned with fire. So let's go ahead and put that up here, put some fire. And then we have the day of God. And this will dovetail really nicely into some things we're going to be talking about from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about Christ having to put everything under his feet and then he'll hand the kingdom to his father. So during this time of the millennium, 
This is uh, when Christ is going to rule. One of the goals of the millennium is for Christ to put everything under his feet, to conquer the world for, for God, and then hand it all over to his Father. So when we talk about the millennium, uh, we're talking about this thousand-year day of the Lord. And that day, Peter says, is going to come in like a thief in the night. In other words, when the millennium begins, we don't know when that's going to happen. So the day and hour that we don't know when that happens is the day that the millennium will start. It comes in like a thief. Comes in like a thief. So if we're talking an end time timeline, what does this look like? When does the day of the Lord start? Well, the day of the Lord starts right here. And it starts with the coming of Christ. This is when he is going to rule and reign. Okay, this word coming is the Greek word parousia, which is when a king comes to take control of a kingdom. All right, so it has to do with a king reigning. It has nothing to do with the rapture or anything like that. Okay, the coming of the Lord has nothing to do with the tribulation or the rapture. It has to do with when is Jesus going to set up his kingdom? When is that going to begin? Well, it starts on a day that we don't know. So if we were to look at a timeline of how this would look right now, um, we're over here somewhere waiting to be taken to God into his throne, ready to be raptured. But right here is the beginning of the abomination of desolation. Okay, and we know that between Christ's second coming and the abomination of desolation, there's 1,260 days or 42 months. We also know that the tribulation of those days is going to be cut short. We also know that the day of the Lord will come in like a thief in the night. We don't know when that will be, but we do know that the coming of the Lord will be after the abomination of desolation okay, and before his visible return, his visible second coming. So it's on a day over here, sometime after the beast has begun to reign, but before his visible return. So the disciples in Matthew 24 asked, so when are you coming? What's the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So the end of the age is going to end when the new age, that is the millennial reign, the millennial age, day of the Lord, begins. And that won't happen until, again, sometime after the abomination, but before the second coming of Christ. So the reign of the beast is, over, is going to overlap the day of the Lord the millennium. And the first part of the day of the Lord is actually wrath. So when the Lord was talking to Israel through the prophets and he said, why do you long for the day of the Lord? Why do you want this? Why do you want this millennial reign? Of course, they didn't know it was the millennium. They didn't know it was a thousand years. But, you know, why do you want the rule of Christ to come? Don't you know that it starts out with darkness and not light? wrath. It's not going to be a happy day when that happens. And we know that the day that this age ends and this millennial age begins is going to be with the signs of the sixth seal. The sun goes dark, the moon turns to blood. People see the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, according to Matthew. They will see uh, Jesus, the Lamb, and the Father on the throne. And on earth they're going to say, the great day of his wrath has come, and who can stand this is all during the reign of the beast. So the coming of the Lord has nothing to do with the rapture, particularly. It doesn't really have anything to do with um, the tribulation. It has to do with when is Christ going to rule. And before he can actually set up his rule, there has to be a time when the wrath of God is being poured out. And the goal of this particular wrath is actually to execute judgment on the fallen ones. Because remember, during this period of time, every fallen angel, every watcher from the pit, all the demons, Satan, the beast, the false prophet, people who want to follow the beast, all the hybrids are going to be on earth at that time. Every place will have been emptied out um, in heaven and on earth and under the earth of all the bad guys. And they're all basically put in this one location on earth and that when Christ returns, He's going to execute judgment 
on the beast, the false prophet, the fallen angels, they're all going to be cast into the lake of fire. So that when Jesus actually begins uh, to rule from Jerusalem, there isn't any fallen entity on the earth. None. Zero. He is not going to have them uh, polluting his um, perfect kingdom. So there's two basic reasons for the millennium. The first one is to fulfill the covenants that God made to Abraham and to David. Uh, God made a covenant to Abraham and to Jacob as well that this land um, would be theirs and their descendants. And this land in the Middle East is the place that God said he wanted to put his name and he was going to give a very large swath of land to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The second reason, and I think, you know, equally important, is the idea that Christ is going to um, put all of God's enemies under his feet. Okay, so what that basically means is that Jesus is going to make sure that he exercises control over and does away with any of God's enemies. Uh, let's just take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This whole chapter is talking about the resurrection, but there's other information that's in this passage. Verse 23, I'm talking about the resurrection, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits. So we're going to use harvest imagery here. Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. In other words, there is nobody Nobody, nobody that had an immortal or eternal body before Jesus did. Okay. And there is nobody but him right now that has a glorified immortal body. Because of this um, harvest imagery that's being used here of first fruits, main harvest, and gleanings. So let's take a look at what the main harvest is. Then at his coming, those who belong to Christ... So at his coming is when he's going to set up his um, kingdom and all those who belong to Christ. In other words, anybody who's a, a Christian whether um, or a person of faith, whether you're from the Old Testament days, whether you're uh, from you know, a, a believer right now, whether you come to Christ during the reign of the beast, it doesn't matter. If you belong to Christ and you're resurrected when he returns, okay, by this point in time, and you're resurrected into uh, an immortal body, you belong to Christ, okay? And you will be part of what we call the main harvest. And then comes the end. So now we're talking about gleanings, okay? Then comes the end. When is the end? The end is when he delivers the kingdom uh, to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. So Christ is going to destroy Every enemy, all rule, and all power. This includes the spirit entities who are, you know, running around the world today. This includes um, Satan, uh, the beast, the false prophet, any king or person who sets themselves up against uh, God. Christ is going to destroy, destroy every rule, every authority, and power. And it says that he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. Verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Okay, and we know that right here at the time of the great white throne judgment, once the heavens and earth have been dissolved, uh, Satan will be cast into the lake of fire and death and Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire right at this point in time, at the time of the great white throne judgment. Verse 27, For God has put all things in subjection under his feet, but when it says all things are put in subjection under him, it's plain that he is accepted who put all things under him. So when all things are subjected to him, that is when everything is subjected to Christ, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things under him, that God may be everything to everyone, including to Christ. So the goal of this thousand-year day of the Lord, the millennium, 
is not just to fulfill the covenants or the promises that God made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and to David too, to always have a man on his throne, but for Christ to put all of God's enemies under his feet. And he's going to do this in a systematic way. He's going to take all the spirit beings, fallen angels, the beast, the false prophet, hybrids, all of those, and they're going to be destroyed right here at his second coming. Basically, this whole time period of the tribulation is to consolidate uh, pe people and entities and bring all of God's people, for the most part, to heaven and keep all the fallen ones on the earth, for the most part. Okay, there, there will still be Christians and just different people living on earth, um, sort of mixed in with all of the fallen ones. But God is going to separate them out, and that's... Um, very plain from the parable of the sheep and goats that when Christ returns, this separation is going to occur so that when he sets up his kingdom and begins his reign during the day of the Lord, there aren't going to be any fallen angels, watchers, hybrids, the beast, anything like that. And even Satan himself is going to be put in the pit so that there isn't any undue pressure on people living at this time to sin more than they would normally sin. So this brings up something that's pretty important that I think that we understand because the story of the end times is told mostly using symbols, all kinds of symbols. And uh, people throw out symbols of the bride and the bridegroom, man-child, the sons of God. There's, there's all kinds of symbols that are used to describe what's happening during the end times. And the most common symbolism for believers is that of a bride, and for Christ is that of a bridegroom. And the rapture is when the bridegroom comes to take the bride. I'm going to tell you why this symbolism doesn't actually work. Um, it doesn't work because of what we read in Revelation. So the whole bride, um, and bridegroom and coming to get the bride and then being in heaven for you know seven years during a seven-year tribulation this doesn't fit uh, prophetically or symbolically with what we read in the Word of God. So when we see Jesus in uh, Revelation chapter 5, he is receiving a commission. This is the scroll, the seven-sealed scroll. What's in the scroll? Well, this is basically the game plan or, or the war plan for how Christ is going to act on God's behalf to take out God's enemies. He's being commissioned or receiving the commission to take out all the fallen ones, the angels, the bad angels, the demons, the watchers, the beast, the false prophet, anybody who sides with the beast, takes the mark of the beast, worships the image of the beast, or is an earth dweller or a hybrid. Okay? This is Jesus' commission to do that. Jesus has the power to overcome all of those bad guys. He has the power to overcome them. And he is receiving this commission to do that. And the game plan and the, the judgment and everything is all written inside of this book. And you know what's written inside of it because of what happens when the scroll is finally opened after the seventh seal. And that's when the wrath of God begins and the judgment is poured out on the beast, the beast kingdom, anyone who sides with the beast. So what this tells me is that Jesus is acting as God's agent. He's accepting a commission. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the warrior king. And because he is a warrior, that's how we kind of see him, especially when he comes back on the white horse. And because Jesus is engaged in this commission that God has given him, he actually can't get married. He <laughs> can't be married because of what the Bible tells us about that in Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 5. It says this, When a man is newly married, he shall not go out with the army or be charged with any business. He shall be free at home one year to be happy with his wife whom he has taken. According to this commandment that's in the Old Testament, and by the way, so much of the commandments and the feasts of the Lord and the story of the children of Israel are prophetic in nature. Because we know that someone who is newly married 
can't go out with the army. That is, he's not to be involved in any kind of warfare. And he is not going to be charged with any business. He doesn't have any commissions. He doesn't have anything to do. He gets a year-long vacation. And when we look at what's going on in the book of Revelation with Jesus and opening the seals and the times that we see him appearing on, on the earth doing different things, he is at work. He has received a commission. He's not getting married, not yet. And during the millennium, he is also working. He is working to subdue all of God's enemies. When Jesus hands the kingdom to God, guess who gets a vacation? <laughs> it's Jesus. Jesus gets a vacation. God is, every, all enemies have been subdued. There is no more warfare and there's no more commission from God to be doing anything because it's all been done. So that's when Jesus takes his bride, and that's actually when you see the bride, and the bride comes down from heaven, that is the holy city, and those who occupy the holy city come down to live on, on the new earth, sets down on the new earth, God makes his home in the holy city uh, with Jesus, the lamb, all of us, and then on the new earth there are people who are going to be living there. So the whole bridegroom analogy breaks down um, at, at many levels, and this is a really important one that I think we need to kind of take note of. The bride won't be fully formed, fully brought together, and given her beautiful garments until just before um, the holy city comes down and the, the wedding feast takes place. And at the wedding feast, the spirit and the bride invite people living on the new earth to come into the holy city and eat from the tree of life and drink from the water of life. So who is going to be living on the new earth and what are people going to be doing? Well, let's look a little bit at the geography here. Okay, so during the millennium, this is sort of kind of how it's going to be. There's going to be people from the nations living here. Not everybody dies during the tribulation, okay? A lot of people will still be alive, and not everybody will have taken the mark of the beast. And those people going into the millennium, they will be here from the nations, and they are just, they're regular mortal people, okay? They're not immortal will be immortal, but they will be mortal. And they will be procreating, okay? They'll be having children, having babies. And Christ is gonna make this place a beautiful place. It's gonna be like the Garden of Eden. Life uh, expectancy will go way up. And this is, you know, for mortal people. Uh, people will still die, but if someone dies at 100 years old, they're considered a baby. Okay, so we know that Sheol, that is the place of the dead, as well as the spirits who control this death and Hades, they are still going to be present. They won't have been cast into the lake of fire and they won't be um, in the pit or anything like that because they are still going to be, death is still going to be operational during the millennium. At the beginning of the millennium, Satan is going to be cast into the pit. Okay, and the pit is a separate place from Sheol or Hades. It's a place of torment. Okay, and Satan will be in the pit during this whole time. When Jesus comes back, he's going to rule from Jerusalem. The remnant of Israel will be brought out of the wilderness and will be part of the new Israel. Okay. These are the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who will comprise this uh, new Israel. It'll be really big. The Millennial Temple will be on top of the mountain in Israel. And Christ will have taken the beast and the false prophet and thrown them into the lake of fire. And 
the scriptures tell us in Revelation 14 that it's in the presence of the Lamb and the holy angels. So they're going to be able to see the burning of the individuals who are in here. And remember, this place was prepared for the devil and his angels. And we also know that at the end of the tribulation, that it's the judgment of the great day for the angels who had been in the pit. So also in the lake of fire are going to be those watchers who married human women. All the demons and uh, hybrids, um, also known as earth dwellers, all in the lake of fire here. They're all going to be burning in the lake of fire. And it's going to be on earth. Now it may in my mind, it's sort of like, this is Jerusalem, and that's like the Dead Sea, where Sodom and Gomorrah were, you know, geographically. They're going to be thrown into the lake of fire when Jesus returns. And so when he's got his millennial kingdom going, he's here ruling from Jerusalem. We have the nations who are mortal people having children, and, uh, you know, eventually some of them die, and, you know, if they're good, they will be their spirits will be in the good part of Sheol, and if they're bad, they're going to be in the bad part. And how do we know who's good and bad? Well, if you love Jesus and serve him, well, and you die, you go here. And if you are a rebel, you're going to go here. And eventually, all the rebels from that lived during the time of the millennium, all the rebels will, will be thrown into the lake of fire as well. And what's interesting is that they know that this exists because it's here. It's here on earth. And it's visible to Christ. He can see it. The holy angels can see it. It's visible. It's not like it's a secret or anything like that. Okay, so in addition to Christ being here on earth, believers are going to be here in their glorified state. So we have glorified believers, and they're going to rule with Christ. Now, there's a lot of capacities for rulership. Um, and if you go to 1 Chronicles 24, basically chapter 24 through, I think, 26 or 27, it, this is the administration for Solomon's temple, which is prophetic. It's a prophetic picture of Jesus as the man of peace who is going to be ruling a kingdom of peace. There won't be any wars. Everything that go from a military industrial basis of, you know, economies where fighting war is profitable to an agricultural system. There won't be any wars. During this whole time here, no wars. But it will be an enforced peace. Christ is going to rule with a rod of iron. And he is going to allow believers also to rule with a rod of iron. That is, um, people have to do what we say. It, it, this rule will be enforced. And there's different areas. Uh, there are some people who will have a more priestly role. There are some who are like gatekeepers. There are those who are engaged in worship. And the number 24 is associated with all of them including uh, commanders and generals, that is, the military. So there is going to be a policing force here that's going to make sure that everybody does what they're supposed to do. And because we have nations, we there are also going to be human rulers of the nations. So we are the, the kings and priests uh, who rule with Christ, and then there are also going to be kings down here, mortal kings among the nations. Now, Zechariah tells us that everybody is going to be required to go up to Jerusalem uh, to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. And if they don't go up, they're not going to get any rain in their country. And so people are going to be made to do things that they might not necessarily want to do, but the peace will be enforced. You know, I just want you to think about this a little bit. Why when Satan is released for that little while after the millennium, why he's going to get a following. So the people who start out when the millennium begins, they're people who've come out of, out of the nations. They've lived through the worst time in human history. It will never be that bad again, ever. They've lived through 
uh, wars and famines and pestilence and the the all the fallen ones being on earth and uh, all the defilement that goes with that and the beast and the false prophet and hunger and want and privations they will have lived through all of this and when Christ comes and sets up this beautiful kingdom on what had been a ruined and desolate earth in fact uh, Revelation 11 says that that God is going to destroy the destroyers of the earth the earth will be basically annihilated destroyed when Christ returns and Christ is going to re uh, rebeautify the earth I'm not sure how to say this it's not exactly recreate but he's going to take away the curse okay take away the curse in the sense that things will be able to grow and they'll be beautiful and lovely and the climate will be great and and it's you know it's going to be really beautiful so any of you who like gardening or you like working with the earth or you like being outside I'm sure there's going to be things for you to do as part of those who are going to rule with Christ, that is, establish this kingdom, um, both physically and socially, okay, and morally and spiritually. So there's going to be a lot of places for believers to use their gifts and, uh, and abilities that um, have been placed inside of you. There's actually going to be a hierarchy here. So we have um, God, of course, who is in heaven. And he's transferred authority to his son, to Jesus, who is going to rule and reign. He's the king. And he is the king of kings. Okay, so there are mortal kings who will be ruling on earth over the nations. And Jesus is going to be ruling from Jerusalem. So this is basically going to be the capital. And underneath Jesus are his uh, kings and priests. This is us. We're glorified. We are like Jesus in so many ways. We are made into his image. And we carry his glory and his power and his authority. And and his beauty and we're immortal we cannot sin we cannot die and we have this this glory that's upon us so when Satan is released at the end of the thousand years there are going to be people who've been born who have no idea about what life was like it's just a theory okay it's just a theory just like when we think of the Garden of Eden all we have is just our imagination. And for them, it'll be just imaginary. Okay, it'll just be, a, you know, whatever they can think about. They'll, they'll know it happened. But when Satan comes on the scene, what he does is he takes truth or information and he twists it just a little bit and he creates a lie. And in the garden, he approached Eve and he said, are you not to eat of that tree? And Eve said, no, I'm not supposed to eat it, and I'm not supposed to touch it. And the serpent said, well, you know, you're not going to die if you eat from that tree. You'll be like God. You'll be like God. And that's always been the temptation. And the fact is, is that we are going to be closer to being like God, because we're like Jesus, right? And the temptation for the people, and this is just my conjecture, but it seems real logical based on um, history, spiritual history, that what Satan is going to offer them is the same thing. You can be like God. Because people are not going to want to keep obeying us. We're, who are we? You know, And there is this very interesting passage in the book of Numbers. In Numbers 16, uh, we read about Korah's rebellion. Okay, so who's Korah? Well, he was somebody who lived um, at the time of Moses and the Israelites when they were in their wilderness wanderings. And Korah took some men, uh, 250 leaders or elders of the congregation. They were well-known men, well-respected, and they assembled themselves together against Moses and Aaron. And they said to them, you've gone too far. 
for all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? These men were jealous of the position that Moses and Aaron had received from the Lord. They were jealous. And they said, well, God is with us too. You know, we're as good as you. And why can't we go into the tabernacle and, and do all of that stuff? Why can't we have the same kind of position that you have? So what God did is, was he told all of those men to bring their censers uh, to, to the entrance of the tent of meeting. And every one of them brought their censers. Uh, and their censer was, it was their, the sign of their um, priest, priesthood, that they, that they were qualified to act as priests. So they all brought their censers. And then the Lord told Moses and Aaron to tell everybody to get away from those people. To get away from the dwelling of Korah and Dathan and Abiram, who were the ringleaders here. And so everybody did that. And that's when uh, the ground opened up and it swallowed them alive. They went alive into Sheol, which is a very odd thing. They went down alive into Sheol. And fire came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. This is kind of a prophetic pattern. It describes how jealousy and pride can get into even, you know, the elders here of these people, people who were smart and wise and, um, you know, people who had leadership qualities, and they were jealous. They were jealous of Moses and Aaron. And that jealousy then led them to a rebellion, which in numbers is called Korah's Rebellion. And this is referred to also in the New Testament as a really bad uh, event that took place in the book of Jude. Uh, and Jude talks about this in verse 11. Woe to them, they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perish in Korah's rebellion. This is a, a human sin. Okay, This isn't something that the fallen angels and so on did. This is this is how Satan gets to people. It's through pride. It's through a sense of self-importance and that I should be able to have a certain position and, um, you know, being jealous. So I think that that is the temptation that is going to be used when Satan is released and he wants to deceive the nations. It's you shall be as God. You can be like these people and who's like Jesus, who's like God. You can be like that. And the fact is, is that anybody who lives after um, the coming of the Lord will never, never be glorified, will never be a part of this ruling and reigning group of people. It's a limited time offer, and it's limited up to the coming of the Lord. When Jesus returns, that's the end. There is no more uh, being like God after that. We're going to be as close to being like God. We're invited into the fellowship of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a unique and personal way that nobody who is alive at that time living in mortal bodies will ever be able to do. And it will, I mean, it will never happen for them. It's a limited time offer. And that the door for that closes when Christ returns at his coming. So let's take a look at this rebellion in Revelation chapter 20. And I think that this rebellion is actually referred to in some of the Psalms. I think Psalm 2 might be one or Psalm 110. Um, that this is a rebellion that's going to take place at the end of the millennium. But here's the deal. Revelation 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who's the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, shut it and sealed it over him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were ended, and after that he must be loosed a little while. There is going to be no deception allowed during the reign of Christ. Okay? There isn't going to be anybody coming in and deceiving anybody. Okay? It's just a reign of peace and love and truth. 
and you have to get in line. If you're a, a mortal person and you have a tendency to want to rebel, well, there's, there's going to be consequences for rebellion. Go down to verse 7. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be loosed from his prison, and he'll come out to deceive the nations which are at the four corners of the earth, that is, Gog and Magog. Uh, the name Gog is actually the word for a leader or a ruler, and Magog is an alliance of nations. This is not the same Gog-Magog that we read about in Ezekiel 38. They're very different, very different wars, different people, different um, uh, circumstances around which the war starts, and different ways that it ends. So don't conflate these two. It, um, we're talking about a, a ruler, a prince, a man. Um, Gog, it's not a spirit, it's a person, because Satan can only rule through people, remember. Only people have dominion, and so he always has to rule through a person. That's why he uh, has to have the, the beast, his son, that he rules through, and his son is a human being. It's a, he's a person, he's a man. And it's why Satan tried to tempt Christ, who was a man, because he wanted to rule through uh, through men. He wants to rule through people because God gave dominion to the earth, to, to mankind. So uh, he has to use a, a man. So he's going to use this guy, uh, symbolically referred to as Gog and Magog. And Magog is an alliance. It's not, um, it's a country, but it's uh, symbolically, it's a, it's a group of countries or nations. And gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. The fact that there's so many people that fall for this deception, and, and I think it is the deception, you shall be as God. You will be like those people, those glorified people. You will be like Christ. You can, you can be, you can attain to that. And I think that's the promise that he's giving these people, even though that's not true. They can't do that. Um, but people will believe it. They'll be deceived, just like Eve was deceived. And they marched up over the broad earth and surrounded the camp of the saints. So that is actually where glorified believers are going to live while they're serving here. But because um, of how we read uh, 1 Chronicles 24, uh, where we know that the, the priesthood actually rotates in and out of being in the temple. And so there's a, a rotation of being here and then going into heaven and serving God and then coming back to earth again. So there is this um, sense that you're not here all the time, so you're kind of in a camp. You're not in a permanent city. Um, the beloved city is Jerusalem. And then it says, but fire came down from heaven and consumed them. So there isn't even a battle here. This is, they show up, they're all consolidated uh, near Jerusalem. And because they're all in one place, they're all going to be destroyed uh, with, with fire. And then it says, the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. This is immediately what happens. Satan will be thrown into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet were and they'll be tormented day and night. Um, and then what happens is anybody who hasn't been resurrected yet, okay? So we know Christ was raised first. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. The, the first one, the guarantee of a greater harvest. And then we have um, believers this is the second time people are resurrected. That's those who are his at his coming. Okay, so this is the first. This is the second. And then we have, then comes the end. Okay, then comes the end. And this is the great white throne judgment. This is the resurrection that takes place of anybody else who has not risen from the dead or been raised from the dead. And uh, the passage in 1 Corinthians says that as in Adam all sin, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Anybody who's ever a been a human is going to be resurrected from the dead. All right, so now we know that there are people who are going to live on the new earth. Okay, and there are people who are going to go into the lake of fire. 
What's commonly taught is that everybody who's resurrected here goes into the lake of fire. That's what people teach, that everybody who's resurrected, everybody who's a non-believer goes into the lake of fire. They call that hell. Everybody goes to hell. And I, they don't know who goes on the new earth, okay? <laughs> they kind of guess about that. But my belief is that most of the people who've died are actually going to live on the new earth. Their names will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Okay, so they, they will have their name in the book of life. We know for sure that some people will go to the lake of fire. <clears throat> we know that anyone who takes the mark of the beast or worships the image of the beast or any of that, any person who does any of that is going to be in the lake of fire. And that's why God warns don't do that because you for sure will end up there. We, we know that during the millennium, people will die. And the people who die, some of them are going to be people who love Jesus. So at this resurrection right here, when they're raised from the dead, are they going to be thrown into the lake of fire? I mean, they love Jesus. They died. Will they be thrown into the lake of fire? The answer to that is no. They're not going to be thrown into the lake of fire. And this was my first indication that what people were teaching about this wasn't true. Because I'm thinking about, yeah, what about people who live during the millennium? What about those who love Jesus? Are they going to be thrown into the lake of fire? That doesn't seem right. Well, they're not. They're actually going to uh, have their names in the book of life. And Revelation 21 tells us about these people who are living during the millennium. That the good ones, the ones who conquer, will have this heritage. I will be his God and he shall be my son. So when the day of God begins and the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem comes down, all believers who are currently sons of God become the bride of Christ. And God is actually going to have a new group of sons. Those are the people who love Jesus who come out of the millennium. And those who are the cowardly, the faithless, polluted, murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot shall be in the lake of that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That is a reference to people who are living during the millennium. Okay, It's not um, about people who are living like now. If you're a believer, you've already passed from death to life. You don't enter into this judgment to begin with. You never go there. So we're talking about this judgment at the great white throne judgment. In addition to the, the good people, who serve Jesus, even though they're sinners, it, the blood of Jesus is going to cover their sin. The, Jesus is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. So his blood can cover anybody over here. Unless they have chosen to not be saved, they've chosen to you know, take the mark of the beast, follow after the beast, or they've chosen to follow after Gog and Satan, um, at the end of the millennium. They believe the lies. They want to believe the lies that they can be like God and that they can be like us. They can't be like us. They can never be like us, us glorified saints. Um, the best they can do is have an immortal body and live on the new earth. And that apparently isn't going to be good enough for them. They're going to know about that, but they don't want that. They want, they want to be like God. All right, so... There are people who are going to have their name in the book of life and they will live on the new earth. And the new earth also has a kind of a hierarchy. There are going to be kings on the new earth. And they're going to bring their glory into the holy city. Uh, Revelation 21, uh, 24 by its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it, and its gates shall never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. So there's kings, and then you can assume that there are people going down to, um, you know, to the lowest echelons, okay, of, of society. And there's going to be nations, uh, different groups of ethnic, um, different ethnicities, so there's, there's going to be people who are kings on the new earth. They're at the top of the heap here, whose names were in the book of life. But technically, because they, they didn't know the Lord, 
um, they weren't like called chosen and faithful before Christ's second coming. So, you know, they may have been people who lived years and years and years ago who never heard of Christ who followed their conscience. Please read Romans chapter 2. This talks about the judgment of non-believers. Right? It's not something that gets quoted very often because we like to think in terms of, of heaven and hell. And if you don't um, haven't had an opportunity to personally receive Christ, then automatically you're going to hell just because you haven't heard. And that's, that's not what the Bible teaches. So I, I just want to read this to you <laughs> so that you understand that God isn't like that. Okay, so this is Romans 2, starting with verse 6. For he, that is God, will render to every man according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are factious and who do, do not obey the truth but obey wickedness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. All who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. When Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show what the law requires is written on their hearts, and while their conscience also bears witness, and conflicting thoughts accuse or perhaps excuse them, on the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. So there is a day of judgment coming for people. And there are people who do what the law requires, even though they've never heard of the law. They may not know Jesus or anything. And those are people who are going to have their names in the book of life. And they're going to be judged according to their works. So if people have done good things. They're well-doers. They, they uh, have wanted to seek glory, honor, and peace. Well, that, that, that's what they're going to get in eternity. All right, so we have the nations and the kings, people who are going to live on the new earth here. This is the new earth, new earth. And coming down out of heaven is going to be uh, the New Jerusalem, great, great big, great big city, New Jerusalem. And God is going to live here, and believers, and the Lamb. This is the home of the bride. Sons of God will be here. They're sons. We're the bride. We've made ourselves ready, and we're come, we've come down. People from the nations will be able to enter into, and there's, there's a lot of gates here, they'll be able to go in, into the holy city, and inside of the holy city is the tree of life. Okay, we've got the tree of life here with fruit. This is the throne of God. From inside the holy city, uh, the water of life will be flowing. Okay, the water of life will be flowing. And people will be able to come into the holy city, eat from the tree of life, and drink from the water of life. And there's another place that's outside the city. There's actually two places. Okay, one of them I think is actually under, un, is going to be down here somewhere. Um, the lake of fire will be down here somewhere. And people who are in the New Jerusalem will be able to see it. And then there is another place way outside the holy city. It's called Outer Darkness. And the only people who are in that place are their believers. Okay, and Jude 
talks about them, and Second um, Peter talks about them. These are really wicked people, but they were born again. They were truly born again. They really were. It's not like they pretended. They really were born again. And then they apostatized. Then they turned from the Lord. And they're saved. That is, they're not in the lake of fire. But they're outside of the holy city. They're in outer darkness. Remember, the new Jerusalem is a city of light. It's a city of light. So when we talk about eternal destiny and where do people go after they die, there's, there's a lot of places here. Okay, there's, there's a lot of places and understanding the geography of Revelation, including Hades and Sheol, the pit, the earth, the nations, heaven, the new Jerusalem, uh, the new earth, outer darkness. These are all places that we need to know about because they're, they're not the same places. This is also can be Gehenna, which in the New Testament is sometimes referred to as hell. Um, and it's, it's basically the garbage dump. It's where the garbage goes. It's where the garbage goes. All right, not a very happy note to end this on, but it's important to understand the geography of Revelation, which is kind of what this is, as well as who are the groups of people who are going to inhabit eternity. There's Jesus and God, there's holy angels, there's um, believers who've been invited into this um, holy city to be uh, fellowshipping intimately with God the Father and the Lamb. And then there are people who are going to live on the new earth, who will be able to come into the city and visit and have the marriage supper of the Lamb and all of that. And then there are people who were truly born again. They really were. And they, because you can't lose your salvation, can't lose your salvation, but you can lose reward. You can lose inheritance. And if you're extremely wicked, and they give examples of Korah, Balaam, Cain, uh, you end up here in the garbage dump. You don't have the beautiful garment you don't have the wedding garment on, according to the parable. Uh, you're, you're not in the lake of fire. Okay, you're, st you're saved. You're saved from this. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you get that. Um, you don't get to live in the new Jerusalem unless you're someone who loves and obeys Jesus and serves him. All right, so I just thought I would do this little <laughs> kind of long overview uh, leave a comment in the comment section, and we'll see you on another video. Till then, have a blessed day.